actually have the minutes of the previous, of the previous meeting in the agenda package. <coughs> no additions or corrections to the motion to approve. Second. Questions? All in favor, let me know by the vote side aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none. The minutes are approved. At this time, a public hand is called to order to receive Senate Common Judge in the whole fiscal year 2023-2024 age come counterpoint. The public hearing is called to order. Uh, Mr. Peters, would you please read the public notice? Yes, sir. Notice is hereby given that the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners will conduct a public hearing on Monday, June 5th, 2023 at 7 o'clock p.m. for the purpose of receiving citizen comments or input on the proposed 2023-2024 fiscal year budget. Citizens interested in reviewing the proposed budget can do so by visiting the Edgecombe County website at www.edgecombecountync.gov. A copy will also be available for viewing the Edgecombe County Manager's Office in the County Administration Building, two hundred one sixty Andrew Street, Street 42, Harper and Con, 786. Citizens who wish to address the board on this matter may do so at the meeting during the public hearing. Citizens may also submit their comments via email to publiccomments at edgecombeco.com or by mail to Frankie Mungo, Clerk of the Board, PO Box 10, Harper and Con, 27886. All written comments received by 5 o'clock p.m. on June 5th will be read at the meeting. Mr. Yes, Evans. Sir, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm going to share tonight a presentation to the board as well as to our citizens that are gathered here. First, for uh, for your benefit, just want to note that in your agenda packet, uh, there is uh, draft copies of the related budget ordinances. Uh, there is a copy of my presentation. Uh, there is also uh, the budget message for FY24. So. I'm going to uh, walk over here, sit out my back is not to our citizens. Yeah, so we've got um, we've got some new equipment in here now. You see, we've got screens, uh, a screen just behind the commissioners here for your benefit, and screen in the back for uh, for our board members to be able to see. This is our first time using it, so I hope it works well. So Mike. So I um, wanted to be able to share with, uh, with you all tonight, the board has had an opportunity to hear um, a recommended budget for FY24. Um, wanted our citizens, those of you that are here tonight, those that are listening uh, via Zoom, to hear just an overview of our budget, our proposed budget for FY24. We'll have uh, Mr. Wiggins will open up the, the public comments in just a few minutes, but want to give you an opportunity to hear what we plan to do for next uh, next fiscal year. So, we uh, we had a number of objectives that were sort of the the, the guardrails, if you will, that uh, helped to advise us as we work on uh, the budget for next year. And you see what they are. We want to balance the budget with no tax increase, to make room to implement a compensation plan uh, that I'll talk a little bit more in just a, about that in a few minutes, to minimize our fund balance appropriated, find operational efficiencies, address critical capital needs, to align agency funding to our vision, mission, and priorities. To follow our physical properties, our board adopted a set of physical properties uh, back in 2015 to make sure that we follow those physical policies. Also to allow the budget to reflect our board's uh, and, and your priorities. Uh, so met with the, the commissioners had their annual retreat back in March. And in talking about the vision for the county and their priorities for next year's budget, we had some discussion, and out of that discussion, they came up with four uh, priorities for next year's budget. You can see them here on the screen. Employee salaries, public safety, education and workforce, and economic growth. And so, in, in, in thinking about our budget, we, we took a step back as an organization to really think about where, where we are as a county and where we want to go. So. We, we started thinking about our vision for the future for our citizens. If you think of a vision as that place off in the distance that maybe you're not quite there, but that's where you want to be. So uh, we did not have, we've had a mission statement as an organization for a long time, but we've never had a vision statement. And so 
Uh, we, we worked on that. We talked about that. We thought about who can we be as a county and who can we be as an organization. And so after having a conversation with our board at their retreat, also with our department heads, they gave great feedback. We used that feedback to craft the vision statement that you have here. And you can see that our desire for our citizens to be a historic, is to be a historic place that values its citizens and natural resources and creates opportunities where people are proud to live, work, and play for generations to come. Now, in order for us to help our citizens get there, to help Edgecombe County get there, we also have to look at ourselves as, as an organization. Who do we need to be as, as an entity? And so we crafted a new vision statement for our organization. I won't read through that, but you can see it there on the screen. So we have now a new two-sided vision statement that looks out to our citizens and, and to, to, to see where do we want to go as a county. And then to look within ourselves to see, well, then who do we need to be as an organization in order to help us to get there uh, as a county? I've described it to many. Some of you have already heard this. I've described it as, you know, it's like we have, uh, we've been, all 550 of us or so get on an airplane every day. We get on this plane and, uh, and, and we serve our passengers. Some on that plane are working on the plane to make sure it flies well. Uh, I have the distinction, if you will, the job responsibility of actually sitting in the cockpit along with some other good folks to help me fly this thing. But then we realize that we're not sure where we're flying to, but now we have a vision. But not only do we know, need to know where we're going together as a county, we also need some fuel to get there. And so for that fuel, we look back to the legacy of our former County Manager, Mr. Lorenzo Carmen. Many of you knew him. Some of us had the honor of uh, working with him. Uh, he came here in August of 2001 uh, and hired me and Fran not too long after he got here. And she and I worked with him for a long time. And Mr. Carmen used to often say that he's sick and tired of us being at the top and bottom of every bad list, right? We got the highest this and the lowest that. We need to work on that. And so he instilled that in many of us who work with him, and certainly that legacy lives on. And so what we have done is we have taken uh, that sentiment of his and we have reduced it to our call to action. And our call to action is simply get off the list. All of those lists that he talked about, we've got one of the highest unemployment rates uh, in, in the state. We've, uh, there's a nationwide county health ranking. Every county in every state is ranked against the other counties in that state. In North Carolina, out of 100 counties, we rank number 99 out of 100. That's as close as you can get to the bottom without actually being on the bottom, right? And that county health ranking is actually a compilation of many other statistics and lists. And so we're, we're gonna work hard to try to get off of those lists. You know, we talked about high unemployment rate, poor health indicators, we're a tier one county, low educational attainment, declining population. We're one of 51 counties in North Carolina that has a uh, declining population according to the 2020 census. And as I mentioned, we're 99 out of 100 counties with the uh, county health ranking. So those are some of the lists. We've got a, a, a group of folks, both some of our staff and other partners who've met a couple of times and, you're going to hear a lot about that over the, over the coming months and really years to come of this long-term work that we're going to do to help us get off these lists. This is not work that will happen overnight or in just a few months or really in one budget cycle. It is work that we have to put in motion that over time uh, that it is, it is going to happen. And I truly believe that Edgecombe County, that we can reach the vision that we have and that five, ten years from now, we won't be the same county that we are now. Uh, my job as the county manager is to work with our team, work with our partners to put that in motion, but we can't do it by ourselves. We need all of you and many other people to join us in, in that uh, good work. So uh, ask the question of, of the board as we were meeting back at their retreat, how can our budget reflect that vision? How can our budget reflect that mission, that call to action. So I'm going to run through just sort of an overview of our budget. Our goal is to try to make sure that our vision, mission, those objectives are reflected in this budget. So 
First of all, I will, I will share with you that overall this budget that we are proposing to our board, um, it, in, it includes no increase in our tax rate. The tax rate will remain 95 cents per $100 in value. Uh, currently, 95 uh, cents generates 351,000, almost 352,000 dollars in Avalor tax revenue. Our total general budget is uh, 72 million 117.829, and this is a uh, decrease from the current year's original budget of about 2.4 million dollars, or 3.2 percent. Uh, we uh, often have to appropriate money from our reserves. It's called our fund balance. Uh, the state of North Carolina says that we are to maintain at least 8% of our annual operating budget has to be in that reserve. Uh, we, we try to build that reserve enough to be able to take care of things that we don't anticipate having to happen, like hurricanes, things like that. Um, and, but we have to maintain at least 8%. Um, we have at the end of our FY22 audit that unassigned, unassigned fund balance reached 26%. So sometimes counties and towns have to appropriate some money out of that fund balance, out of that reserve to balance our budget. And that's something that we have to do as well. And so to balance our budget, we are appropriating $6.3 million uh, from, fun, from fund balance, which is an increase of a little over $801,000 from the original budget this current year. And I will note that we budget that um, to balance the budget, but oftentimes we don't end up using, certainly not all that we appropriated, sometimes not any of it. Sometimes, in fact, as we have in the last few years, we have not used all of it, but we put more money back into that fund balance. Um, so just a, a few slides about our revenue. I know that you can read all of those words up there, right? Your vision is better than mine. Don't, don't even try. I know that from this distance, I should have made those words bigger. The main point in this I want to share with you is that that largest piece of the pie of our revenue pie is ad valorem taxes. The ad valorem taxes that we collect is, is right at 47% of our uh, revenues. Uh, coming in behind that is sales tax is 14 percent, and then uh, and then behind that revenue from that's generated through Department of Social Services just behind that. But our two largest uh, revenue streams is ad valorem taxes and sales taxes. I would just want to show this is sort of looking under the hood at at our budget process. What this spreadsheet shows here is. Uh, this is how we do a calculation to get to a budget amount for ad valorem taxes. Again, uh, this is probably more detail than you want to see. I just want you to be able to see uh, sort of the, the, the workings of how we shape up this budget. Our tax administrator, Ms. Teresa Lewis, is in the room there sitting on the second row. Uh, she provides to me uh, a number as to based on tax listing, what the total value is in, uh, in uh, real property. Public utilities. We also look at what it is for motor vehicles. We uh, then estimate what we think we will collect, and then that's how we come up with these numbers here in the far right uh, or the near, uh, just about to the far right column. Uh, we don't have that final column filled out because the budget has not yet been adopted. Um, also, want to point out for the benefit of the citizens, some of you may not know this, you'll see in that bottom left box there that there are uh, certain exemptions and deferrals. For example, uh, senior citizens and veterans can apply for exemptions from their taxes, and then deferrals is what's called present use value, and that's farmland that's being actively farmed, um, has a uh, present use value that's applied. It's basically reducing the amount that they have to pay on that land. So again, just a little bit of look under the hood. Here's another busy slide here, but this shows our sales tax revenues going, looking back to FY17 all the way to current year. Um, you can see in the last, uh, you can't, but in the, um, in the last couple of years, uh, we've been generating a little over $10 million, last three years, a little over $10 million in sales tax revenues for the county. Uh, if you were to imagine if we were a Wake, a Wake County or even a Nash County, those numbers would be double, tripled, and quadrupled. But uh, these are the revenues that we receive as a county. 
you can see so far this year we're on track to hit just about what we uh, what we received last year. These are all numbers that we as our team that we use to make these budgetary projections. Uh, this is just a, a graph to show you the changes in the in the sales tax revenue over the last uh, the last several years. We look at what we budgeted to receive in sales tax and what we actually um, received. You can see so far this year we're at 8.6 8 million dollars. Here in this column is what we are budgeting, a total of 9.9 .9 million dollars. We are going up in our uh, sales tax budget about 150 thousand dollars. You'll see multiple lines there because there are several different articles, what they call it, and that's based on the state statute that creates that particular sales tax. Um, just a few notes uh, about uh, some other uh, revenue streams here. We've got lots and lots of revenue streams. I won't show all of those here um, uh, in this presentation, but a few of note. Uh, one of those revenue streams is inmate housing. Uh, Sheriff Atkinson at the detention center um, has uh, excess space that is used to house federal inmates. Um, the federal government pays a certain amount per inmate per day, so that generates revenue through the sheriff's office uh, for the county that helps to go back in to cover the cost of operating uh, the sheriff's uh, operations there. You can see that that, uh, that amount has been increasing over the last couple of years thanks to Sheriff Atkinson. He renegotiated that rate with, um, uh, with the federal government just a couple of years ago, and so um, thank, thankful to him uh, for doing that. I think he averages around 50 beds that are slotted for federal, uh, federal inmates. Uh, certainly that detention center primarily is for uh, detaining uh, Edgecombe County folks that happen to pass through there. Um, and if he needs more space, he certainly lowers the amount, that, the number of spaces that he um, allows to, uh, for federal inmates. EMS collections, many of you will probably remember that uh, rescue services, Edgecombe uh, uh, em Emergency Medical Services used to be provided by an outside agency, Edgecombe County Rescue Squad. Uh, county brought that in-house in January of 2021. We collect revenues from that, just like if you call the rescue squad, your Medicaid, Medicare is billed, or your private insurance is billed, certainly for emergency service. If you don't have a way to pay, we still pick you up, um, but we generate some revenues from there, and that just shows uh, some tracking of, of what that revenue has, has looked like. Also, the third, uh, third area that of note is by far not our largest revenue stream, but it was of note. And that is, uh, in, it's called investment income, but what it is, is interest. Um, we have an operating checking account, if you will. That's where we pay our bills on a regular basis, payroll. But we also have a uh, separate uh, account, a trust account. That's where our money is parked until it's needed. And with our unsigned fund balance having grown in the last couple of years and interest rates going up, the amount of revenue that we have generated there has increased. That becomes money that we then can use to build in the budget to help us to provide uh, services for him. So talk a little bit about um, expenditures. Again, I know you can't see that, but um, the largest expenditure category there is public safety. is 28% uh, of our budget. Uh, next largest is education, 20%. General government 15 and social services uh, 16 or social service 16 general government 15. But you can see by far that public safety that includes not only what's budgeted in the sheriff's office, it includes uh, EMS and a couple of other smaller uh, lines. Our by far our largest cost uh, in the budget is is for our folks. Right, we provide services and we do that through people. I mentioned a moment ago we have, we usually hover around 550 full-time employees um, and so at least full-time positions, sometimes not, certainly not all of those positions are filled. A couple of notes about uh, personnel here that I share with the board and want to share with you. We are currently working on an overhaul of our compensation plan. Um, I'm sure you hear all the time employers out there are, are you know, dead heat competing with other employers for, for team members. It's been very difficult to try to attract and retain employees in this very uh, heated market that we find ourselves in right now. 
Uh, we are somewhat a little bit more behind the eight ball because we have not uh, we have not done any work on our compensation plan since around 2009. We have and grateful for our commissioners for allowing us to do some cost of living increases throughout that time. And in fact, last year we did four percent, and so we're grateful for that. That certainly helps us. But we're at a, we're at a point now that not only did we need to do a market study to see what is the market paying for positions, we also needed to update and modernize our compensation plan. The way that it's organized, in some cases, what the position is titled needs to be uh, needs to be modernized. So that's why we're referring to it as an overhaul of our compensation plan. It's been a, a very long and tiresome process. We're grateful for our board allowing us to contract with a company called Mercer. A Mercer that's helping us to do that. They've been working very hard. Our team has been working hard with them. We have not gotten to the point where we know enough to be able to build that cost into this budget yet. So the budget that is currently presented does not include any changes to our compensation plan. Um, you'll see there in the note that um, the board has already called for a work session on June 21st at 10 a.m. We're going to make a presentation to our board of what that compensation plan recommends that we should do. I'll have to make some decisions along with my team to determine if it says we should be here, how much of that can we afford to implement. We'll make that recommendation to the board at their meeting on the 21st. Um, they'll have an opportunity to discuss it. You're certainly welcome to come. We'll be having that meeting just on the opposite side of this hall in conference room 260. So the main takeaway from this is that we're working on an overhaul of our compensation plan. It will have some impact on our FY24 budget. It is not currently built into this budget, but before the board adopts it, um, it, it will be, or we expect it to be if the board agrees with it. So a couple of other notes that uh, we have no increase in our health insurance premiums uh, for next year, so we're grateful for that. We are continue to um, provide the same health insurance program with the supplementary uh, offerings that we have there. You'll see in notes including our wellness program. Um, we're um, adding a medical weight management program to that. The third note there you'll see is regarding our vacancy allowance, uh, what that is. Our approach to budgeting is we budget for every position as if it's going to be full the whole year. So all 550 or so positions is fully budgeted but we know even in good times you don't have all positions budgeted all year long but we always have that in there that's just been our budgetary approach we end up at the end of the year having lapsed salary and so that goes back into you know general fund uh, starting the current fiscal year the year that we're in right now we're using a budgetary approach called a vacancy allowance in other words we go in there and we estimate the vacancies that we will have throughout the fiscal year and we plug in basically a negative number to tie up some of that budget that we expect to not use. That allows us to appropriate that in other places and minimize the amount of fund balance that we have to do. We, uh, we do have a vacancy allowance that is included in next year's budget. Um, next slide is uh, we try not to add any new positions unless we absolutely have to. And so in, uh, in analyzing uh, requests that were made by various department heads, uh, these are a handful of positions that I'm recommending to the board uh, that we add. I won't go through this entire, I won't go through this list really, but I just want to point out that the recommendation to add these positions is based on uh, to improve our services to you, our citizens, or in some way to advance uh, the mission of the county. Um, for example, you'll see there at the top under uh, my department recommending to uh, include the addition of a Parks and Recreation Director position. The board adopted a Parks and Rec comprehensive plan about two years ago. Our goal is over time is to build our involvement uh, in Parks and Recreation activities in the county so that we can help to improve the quality of life for our citizens. Um, one of the recommendations was to create a, a Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. The board has already done that. The board has been meeting for almost two years now, making recommendations. We were already doing what's called a Recreation Mini Grant Program, um, and so uh, we have continued that. 
one of the recommendations from that plan is to add a parks and parks and recreation director position. We believe that in order for us to really grow into that for our citizens, we need to have someone that's working on that every day. So current budget includes adding that position. Also, the second one there on the county manager is what we are calling a career navigator. So we talk about getting off the list, that mission, that call to action, getting off the list. One of those lists that haunts me a lot is our high unemployment rate. I've been with the county for 21 years, and out of 21 years, it's only been about five or six times that we have not been in the top five, and we only barely made it a sixth or seventh position in the whole state out of 100 counties. So that means we've got to do something about that. that that's uncalled for. There's no need for us to consistently have such a high unemployment rate. There are a lot of great agencies and organizations that are doing good work. I think we need to jump in there a little bit more than we are and to help with that work. So one of the things that we're planning to do, if the board approves this through the budget process, we will add a career navigator position. What this person will do is that they will go out and they will find the unemployed folks in Edgecombe County. If you were to go to NC Works website and search the county profile, it'll tell you that there are around about 1,500 people unemployed right now in Edgecombe County. It will also tell you that there are about 1,600 jobs available just in Edgecombe County right now. That's not surrounding counties, just in Edgecombe County. So something's missing there. There's a connection that's missing. <coughs> So that's going to be one of the things, a few different things that this person will do. And, and, you know, there are other positions here that are recommended for the board to consider. Um, outside agencies, um, for FY24, we received a total of 20.3, almost $20.4 million in requests from outside agencies. Outside agencies are those entities, whether they non, be nonprofit, schools, community college, or what have you, that receive money from the county. Some of them receive money because of statutory requirements. For example, counties are responsible for providing funds to the school system for current or operating expense, capital expense, what have you. The board is also required to provide funding for community colleges. So those are examples of statutory requirements. In some cases, we provide funding, uh, funding to outside agencies because of uh, long-standing agreements. For example, uh, we have an agreement with the town of Tarboro to provide funding for the library here in town. We also have an agreement with City of Rocky Mount and Nash County to provide funding for the library in Rocky Mount. So some funding is based on those long-standing agreements. And then other cases, the board just has a choice in who they would like to make strategic investment in, in agencies and organizations that help us to carry out our mission and to serve our citizens. Uh, this year, we have three new uh, agencies or entities that they are not new themselves, but if funded, they will be new to funding from Edgecombe County. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to uh, ask them to come up and share a little bit about what they do. The board has asked them to come and so they can meet them and hear a little bit about what they do. Uh, they are United Community Ministries STEP, which is Strategic, Twin Counties Educational Partnership, and the Mercer Foundation. Um, total recommended funding in this budget of that $20.4 million that was requested is $14,559,192. And that is an increase of $154,153. Now, uh, again, this, uh, this slide here, again, is, 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 is a busy slide. The list of outside agencies that we fund is much longer than this. I just wanted to uh, provide some highlights here. First of all, I want to note that um, as, as a commitment to the education of our children here in the county, um, our board has been meeting with Edgecombe School Board for a number of years. Now we have at least one meeting per year. And we recognize the importance of the investments that we make in our school system. At our last joint meeting, uh, our superintendent, um, she made a presentation and said one of the most critical things is to be able to compete for talent. The most important thing in the educational process is what that teacher does in the classroom. I can say amen to that because I used to be a teacher a long time ago. 
over 20 years, almost 30 years ago, but I still remember that's the most important thing that, that happens. And so um, in order to be able to compete, um, you know that teachers all across the state of North Carolina are paid on the same salary scale, depending on your years of service. Locally, the difference is what's called that supplement. Currently, Edgecombe School pays 7% supplement. That totally comes from funding that this board provides the school system. There are some school districts surrounding us that pay more than that. And so it becomes very difficult for our superintendent to recruit and retain staff. So one of the things that's included in this budget is an increase in funding of $666,000 to increase that local supplement from 7% to 10%. Now that's still, we'd like to be able to go, to go a little bit further next year. We'll take another look at it, but that is a key highlight there I wanted to be sure to, uh, to point out. Uh, I, I will mention that we bought, we're also increasing our funding to Edgecombe Community College, $107,453 additional funds to take care of some critical capital needs that we have, um, and a few other things. I will note, since we're talking about schools, um, that you will see here on the slide that, uh, and you've been hearing talk about a county line merger, maybe some of you just came back from vacation in Europe or somewhere, you haven't heard about it. Um, right now we have four schools that are on the Edgecombe side of Rocky Mount, but they go to Nash County Schools. The district comes across that county line. There's been discussion for a few years now about making a change to that. This board has indicated that they intend to move forward with a, a merger, a county line merger as it's called. I know it's called oftentimes a demerger, but the technical legal term that's in the statute is a county line merger. So moving those school district lines to not cross over those county lines. And so uh, we send funding over to Nash County Schools every year to uh, help educate those somewhere between 1,500, 1,600 students. And so part of this budget includes decreasing the funding for Nash County Schools in order to trigger that county line merger. That state statute says that if we don't pay our proportionate share, it will trigger that to happen. And so in the proposed budget is, uh, we are budgeting uh, a little over $2.1 million, but it does not include the 552,000, that is what is called the gap fund. It covers the difference between what we pay per student, what Nash County pays per student, City of Rocky Mount used to pay, but now that statute says they can pay no longer. Um, it, is, it does not include that. And again, I mentioned about the three new um, agencies that we are considering funding. And Mr. Chairman, if I could, I'd like to invite them up uh, individually so that you can get to meet them. First, I'd like to invite Ms. Uh, Linda Brinson. She's with United Community Ministries, and she's going to tell you a little bit about what they do. Good evening. Okay, I'm the Executive Director for United Community Ministries, and we have been serving our residents of Edgecombe County and Nash County for 44 years. And we have like four different programs. We uh, have like a soup kitchen where we serve the uh, residents for about uh, seven days a week, and it's about 300 uh, people that we serve each week. Plus, we provide like food boxes to people that are lacking, so they get a uh, referral from social services. Also, we have our uh, shelter that's in Nash County for the men and women and we have like 63 beds there and then we have the Bassett Center which is a family shelter that is located in Edgecombe County in Rocky Mountain 916 Grand Street and um, the services that we provide for the clients and all we have like weekly case management meeting with them which we try to tackle like the barriers that's causing them to be homeless and with um, the Bassett Center we actually serve, we have like 12 units and we serve about 56 families a year and out of those 56, maybe about 36 actually go into their own place. And so about 75% of the families that we serve are from Edgecombe County and the other ones are from Nash County. And so, and even with the, uh, the case management, we actually work with them on savings, also um, different goals. So we have a weekly case management meeting, life skill classes for them, empowerment meeting. So we're giving them the necessary tools that they need to 
when they go on the outside that they'll be able to sustain. And so I have been with United Community Ministry about 15 years, and out of those 15 years, I was a case manager and program manager. And so in my 15 years being there, with the families that we have served, I only seen about six that actually came back into our program, which is really great because we have given those the necessary tools and all. And so as of um, last year, we came to the point where we thought we had to close our community shelter because of funding and all. And it takes about 190000 to actually run the Bassett Center. And to run both of the shelters together, it costs maybe close to about 489000 a year and everything. And so, but a lot of kids that came through the Bassett Center, um, kids that social services had contacted us about, and we saved them kids from, um, from going into the foster care system. And so most of the referrals that we do receive are from Edgecombe County Social Services and also we get them from the school system. And uh, some years ago, the total number of kids that were homeless between Edgecombe County and Edge County was like 587 kids. And so we had a waiting list, maybe like 180, which now we got it down to around about 30, which saying that we're actually doing something. We are actually on necessity in the community. And without the Bassett Center, we're looking at kids that we're not having anywhere to go no more than to the foster care system. And one thing about the Bassett Center, with most shelter, if you have a nine-year-old male child, that child is not able to stay with you. They will have to be put in a group home. But with the Bassett Center, if you have kids that are school age or whatever, on up to the age of 18, as long as they are in school, we require them to be in school, they are able to stay there at the Bassett Center. And so our main thing is to keep the families together and also to give them those necessary tools that they need to succeed, you know, uh, when they go on the outside. And also we have a relationship with Rocky Mount Public uh, Housing Authority, and we try to get the majority of the families in there because they are below the poverty level. And, um, you know, some of the barriers that we see, you know, it's like the, um, they are uneducated. A lot of them, you know, don't have that education or either they're low income. And so this is why we try to get them in the housing authority. But if they ever lose a job or something, then they'll be able to just pay that $50 a month. And so, as I said before, you know that it's a necessity what we're doing and everything for the community. Because a lot of kids, you know, they will end up in the system and everything. And that's something that we don't want to see and we want to keep these families together. And any questions? No. First, I just want to thank you for your continued support of our families. Um, we've been a board member on DSS. We appreciate the help that you do give us to try to keep our families together. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we'll invite up Ms. Pam Rule to step. Yes, I'm Pam Gould, I'm Executive Director for STEP, and hopefully you have a couple of things that I've provided you with. Nice to see some familiar faces this evening. Um, so, uh, STEP is just celebrated its 11th anniversary in May. We are a cross-sector collaborative with the ultimate goal of building a strong talent pipeline for the mutual benefit of our employers and employees. Simply put, we connect classrooms to careers, and that is local careers and local companies. STEP connects the dots from cradle to career, creating, supporting, and expanding efforts that ensure students in Edgecombe County are exposed to and fully prepared for the 21st century uh, jobs in our region. Our hashtag work here initiative develops career awareness, seamless pathways to industry recognized credentials, work-based learning experiences, and employer and education partnerships. STEP was selected as one of the 12 My Future NC local education attainment collaboratives across the state, LEA cities. We are leading the work in the twin counties towards achieving a statewide education attainment goal of the two million by 2030. Y'all have already talked about educational attainment and where we are. A little over 18 months ago, our steering committee created the vision to strengthen and increase the educational attainment in Edgecombe and Ash counties by an additional 9% with the focus of educational equity and inclusion. The three established objectives based on our vision and data 
is to better align career and technical education pathways with current research-based labor market findings to increase FAFSA completion by 21% over the next three years. There's a direct correlation to receiving post-secondary credentials and being prepared for jobs with FAFSA completion. And to ensure that third through eighth grade students are reading at grade level. Student, uh, STEP serves as the backbone organization to a steering committee, a community team, and three working groups charged with a call to action deep into our neighborhoods and with our faith-based community and business sectors in Edgecombe and Nash counties. While we are quite proud of our partnerships and our accomplishments, there remains other opportunities for growth. Fortunately, we have built our momentum back up since our COVID slump. As you can see, reflected in the impact report, Commissioner Webb's looking at, <laughs> um, our initiatives impacted over 9,000 students, K through 12 in the Twin Counties. There are over 24,000 students enrolled in our public and charter schools in both counties. It is logical that we serve and address the needs of both counties as we have strong partnerships with our business and industry employers who recruit employees from the Twin Counties as well as other neighboring counties. The goal is to retain our current employers and encourage other ones to come to Edgecombe County, where I am a proud citizen. For your information, we um, are sharing with you the learning base continuum. It, en it encompasses our signature events and experiences around career awareness, exploration, preparation, and career seeking and placement. We are currently laser focused on the far end of that continuum, providing more hands-on <coughs> job experiences, including paid internships, pre-apprenticeships, and apprenticeships. In the last three years, less than 150 students have completed a paid work experience not including our health care pathways because that's part of their course requirement. And that's out of a possible 5,000 or more eligible students. Hands-on job experiences are a time-tested method with a proven track record for producing strong results for our employers and workers. And we know that providing many touch points throughout a student's educational journey increases the probability of cultivating and keeping our talent local. They need to know what is he. It's not hopeless. Case in point, the 2022 impact report cover features a young lady, a native of Tarboro, Mary Samuel Palmer. And Mary Samuel chose not only to continue living here after completing her associate's degree in welding credentials, but it was through our introduction to our employer partner, TransTech Energy, that she is currently employed full-time with TransTech here in Edgecombe County. Hashtag work here. So um, it has been a privilege to be able to talk to you. Uh, we uh, greatly appreciate it, and I hope that you have a greater awareness of Strategic Twin Counties Education Partnership and our passion for thriving Edgecombe County. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. And next, I'd like to invite Mr. James Mercer with the Mercer Foundation. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, again, my name is James Mercer. Um, I retired uh, from Edgecombe County in 2006. I spent 29 years in local government. Also retired as a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army, combat veteran. Today I just want to tell you a little bit about the Mercer Foundation. I have my wife with me. If you would stand, please. That's the lowest. She's the one that does all the work. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that uh, do, does the fundraising for the Mercer Foundation. I am currently the president and founder of the Mercer Foundation. We have been in existence now for about uh, six years. And what we do, we specialize in helping veterans uh, as, a, as a proud 
disabled veteran. I see a lot of veterans out there that are homeless. We started a transitional housing program for homeless veterans. We currently have a, a veteran's home in Rocky Mount, 735 Road Street, and currently we have six veterans currently residing in that facility. Uh, that facility is supported by the Mercer Foundation and various grants that we receive uh, throughout the year. We provide wraparound services for those homeless veterans to include helping them fill out applications, helping them uh, with financial literacy that I teach. Uh, we also have an agreement with the local uh, behavioral health agency that provides uh, behavioral counseling in terms of depression, anxiety, bipolar, and especially PTSD, because most of our veterans are suffering from that. They are Vietnam veterans and they are Persian Gulf veterans as well as Afghanistan and Iraq. We also uh, help those veterans um, get into the VA system by providing and, and coordinating with a uh, VA social worker. And the last thing we do is that uh, we have um, one of our board members that provide and help those veterans um, fill out and apply for VA benefits, uh, medical benefits, um, pensions, as well as disability claims as well. So this is a wraparound service. We try to help them. We also uh, coordinate and work with local um, employment service, uh, have a veteran that's helping those veterans fill out those job applications and coach them with, uh, with interview techniques as well as uh, resume writing. So um, we, we try to keep those veterans in the program no longer than 18 months because it's transitional. The key is, is for us to have those veterans to come in and then get the skills and services that they need to get back on their feet. We give them a hand up, no handouts, and they uh, get uh, hopefully permanent housing in terms of a, an apartment or a home. And we've had some success stories with our veterans. So that's our flagship program. That's the program that I have. Uh, I spend most of my time with uh, trying to help those, my comrades, to who, uh, who are suffering right now. In addition to the Veterans Transitional Home, we also provide um, a food pantry and children's feeding program for low-income uh, citizens in Edgecombe County. We have partnered with the United Way, with uh, Thomas Chapel Missionary Baptist Church to uh, provide uh, food distribution for the past four years uh, out of Thorns Chapel Missionary Baptist Church on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Currently we have about 100 children and 200 families that come through and they pick up about a 50 to 60 pound box of food which includes you know canned goods and dry goods and uh, frozen meats and other staples. So that's, that's ongoing, that's every two weeks and uh, again, that program uh, is funded by donations and by uh, support from the United Way. Um, the other programs that we have, we have a homelessness prevention program as uh, the young lady from the United Community Ministries just pointed out. Homelessness is a problem. It's a problem all over the, the United States. Um, that, that program allows us to um, hire part-time food pantry workers to help receive the food from, from the food bank, to help uh, store that food, and to also help distribute that food. Even though we have volunteers, we still need you know, some part-time individuals to help us because we're touching that food seven days a week. Um, also part of that homelessness prevention program, it allows us to help pay utility bills and also um, rental assistance for low-income individuals that uh, live in, in Edgecombe County 
but specifically in the city of Rocky Mountain. We've had that program now for about three years, and we get a lot of support from the city of Rocky Mountain. The last program that we have is a behavioral health program. We have partnered with the North Carolina Council of Churches. We've received uh, two grants, and we're uh, hoping to receive a third grant where we can provide uh, behavioral health, which is just mental health counseling. We, we've got a contract, one mental health, well, not mental health, but behavioral health agency that's providing the, the counseling for those individuals that need that service. Um, with that said, uh, do you have any questions of me? Any questions of Come on. No questions, but I'll like to speak to you afterwards when we find out how long we might be able to help the partner and volunteer with the uh, Thank church you. before I went to the school. Yes, we always look for volunteers. Thank you so much. Any last questions? No, sir. No. So you can see that these are um, three organizations that are doing great work uh, in the county, and um, we do have we do have twenty five thousand dollars for each of those reserved in this budget. Um, I've met with each of them individually uh, in the last week or so to hear what you heard tonight and, and a lot more details of what they're doing. I do recommend that we move forward with including that in the budget. Prior to you adopting the budget, I will uh, work with them individually to talk about uh, some deliverables and particulars to it, but I do recommend we maintain that in, uh, in the budget as presented and consider funding these three entities. Um, next, just briefly, I know we're getting along here, uh, capital improvements, you'll see we've got a little over $900,000 of capital improvements. This is uh, decreased from the original budget this current fiscal year of about $256,000. Um, we will likely include some FY20 current year's projects that are budgeted, underway, but not yet complete, that will likely have to be rolled into next year's budget, um, and it will add to that $900,000. I do want to mention uh, two other things you'll see here uh, in the presentation that uh, is included in here, the proposed purchase of a space for a DMV office. Um, we have been housing or providing space for a satellite DMV license or driver's license office for a long time, over 20 years, I guess. Um, they normally don't have these satellite offices, uh, the, the two off the main offices that are closest to us in Rocky Mountain and Greenville. Um, many years ago, uh, there was the desire of the board at the time for them to have a presence here in Tarboro to, to provide better service for our citizens here on this side of the county. Where they have been for the last number of years um, has, has not worked out. There have been some issues there, so they have uh, left that space. They have expressed that they're willing to, uh, to return, continue to provide uh, uh, services here in Tarboro in a satellite site. Um, we have worked on identifying another site. Mr. Mike Matthews, our assistant county manager, worked with them to look at the specifications that they were requiring and then the available spaces here in town. And so um, we found that there's one space on North Main Street, uh, most of you will know as used to be First South Bank. Uh, it is available, it meets their requirements, and we're proposing that we, uh, that we occupy or uh, get that space for them to use. When we looked at the long-term cost of leasing that space, we determined that the best approach would be for the county to purchase that building. So included in this budget um, is an amount of uh, $275,000 to purchase this building. And so um, they have indicated that this would be a great space. There's also about $20,000 in there to do some upfit in the building for to make it more accommodating to them. So the board approves this budget as presented. It will include the purchase of that building. Also want to mention a little bit about our animal shelter. I know that our citizens have been hearing us talk about um, working with the sheriff and his team to uh, attempt to build a new animal shelter. Current shelter that we have, we've, we've spent some money in the last couple of years to address some repair needs there. 
um, but really it is way undersized for the need that we have. And so they've been doing a great job, Sheriff's team been doing a great job of using it to the best of their ability. Um, but we know that for the long term uh, benefit of this county, we need a new shelter. So current year's budget, the board um, approved $50,000 in the budget. We have been uh, to do preliminary design work. We've been working with an architect now for several months to work with a team of, of folks, some of our staff, some of the sheriff's staff, to look at what is the best and most appropriate building for us to pursue. We have not gotten that to a point that we're ready to make a recommendation for the board. And so we do not have included in next year's budget any money for construction other than state grant that we've received this year of 775000 So we will continue to reserve that and hold that aside for that purpose. Um, we do have in here, as directed by the board, we have another $50,000 um, budgeted in FY24 to continue that pre-development work that we've been doing. We're hoping with, within the next two or three months or so, we'll be at a place where we have what we think can be a good shelter, not just for now, but moving to the future, but within the realms of what this county can afford to construct and other, we're also exploring some other possible funding opportunities. So just wanted the board to know and for our citizens to know that that is certainly still something that's important uh, to us because our citizens have said that it's important to you. Um, just a brief uh, summary of the capital improvements that are included in this budget. A little over 191,000 is in equipment, 287,000 is in vehicles, that includes $125,000 to purchase vehicles in the sheriff's office. It is not in the capital outlay budget, but we do have in the budget for debt service. Um, we borrowed around $500,000 this current year, and so we have debt service, and that was to purchase vehicles for the sheriff's office. So in this budget is approximately $125,000 to pay on the debt service for that. We borrowed that money for a four-year period. And then lastly, uh, under capital outlay, buildings and grounds include uh, nearly $461,000. Real quick, I'll mention that, um, I will mention that, I'm sorry, I didn't show you those slides, but um, I will mention enterprise funds. So there are a number of things, services we have to provide as a county um, by state statute, a service we have to provide. But then there are some services that we provide that we're not required to provide, but we do it as a service to our citizens. Those types of services are what's called enterprise funds or enterprise services. For us, there are two different things that we do. One is uh, utilities or water and sewer. We have over 5,000 or 6,000 water customers, about 1,500 sewer customers. I see Paul shaking his head. I think we're close, if not right on it. Um, and so that is a service that we provide. The fees that we charge for that should be sufficient to cover the cost of that. That's why it's called an enterprise fund. Second, we provide solid waste. So all of our citizens um, that live outside of our municipalities, there's $125 charge that's included on your tax bill. Uh, that money is used to give you the opportunity to, to bring things to solid waste at no additional cost. We also charge tipping fees. If you bring, whether it be contractors or homeowners or what have you that bring things to our landfill, we charge a certain amount per ton. And so um, based on that and looking at um, the operations of our two enterprise funds, we I've noted here that uh, this slide says possible water sewer rate increase. We've actually built in a 5% increase in our water and sewer rates and that is because we purchased water from the town of Tarboro from the city of Rocky Mount. Both of them have indicated that they will have rate increases. They have not adopted their budget yet, so this may change before the final budget is presented. Also, um, the regional landfill for municipal solid waste, household garbage, pretty much, we don't own a landfill for that. So we get that and we send it to a regional landfill in Bertie County. They charge us a tipping fee for that that includes also the cost of transporting it to Bertie County. We do know that that tipping fee is going up 5.2%. So this budget includes a recommended increase of $6 per ton for, um, for our solid waste tipping fee going to $71 per ton. 
Uh, I've noted to our board, I think it's worth for the public to note, that we, we've had to continue to transfer general fund money into our solid waste operations. Solid waste is, a, is kind of a, a, a difficult thing to balance because we need to charge enough in our fees to cover the costs, but also we try not to drop too much of those costs on our citizens all at once, and so it's a very delicate balance. Um, we do have in the budget this year a little over $400,000 that is appropriated from fund balance uh, to our solid waste um, uh, enterprise. We will be, we're working on currently looking at our business plan for solid waste, so that's something that will be forthcoming uh, to our board. Um, just a few other budget considerations. I'll uh, leave the, the first one last. I'll mention that we are considering uh, doing some level of fleet maintenance in-house um, that will be oil changes, tire rotations, things like that for our very large fleet. We are considering it. We're running the numbers on that. We do not have that budgeted. Um, I've indicated to the board we will continue to look at that into the next fiscal year and determine whether or not that's something that we would um, recommend. We've also been looking at our building security. Unfortunately, we live in a time where we have to be concerned about those things. Uh, we are in you know, public service business, we are in public buildings, and we realize that's part of our job, but also we have to uh, think about the safety of our employees as well as our citizens who frequent our buildings. So uh, Sheriff Atkinson and I have had multiple conversations about the possibility of us um, hiring his off-duty deputies to uh, provide security in our four main buildings, including this building. Um, so we're going to have ongoing conversations about that. Currently, there it is not included in the budget. Last thing, which is first on the list, is Edgecombe Works. You'll see the next slide. Uh, going back to that get off the list, trying to impact that high unemployment rate that we have, Dr. Greg McLeod and I have been talking about this for a number of months. Um, I've shared some ideas. He and his team have taken those ideas and crafted um, uh, some initiatives that we do have built in this budget. Uh, I'm going to invite him to come to the podium. I just wanted you all to hear from Dr. McLeod about our partnership and working on this. Um, as you see him coming, you see we've got three different categories of funding. One is called Earn As You Learn. We've got 25,000 budgeted. <coughs> Promise Program, which is like a scholarship program, 75,000, and Edgecombe Works Academy budgeted for 30,000. <coughs> Good evening, County Commissioners, Administrator staff, residents, visitors, and guests. For those that I've not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Greg McLeod, and I proudly serve as president of Edgecombe Community College. Uh, we have two campuses located at 2009 West Wilson Street here in Tarboro, as well as 225 Tarboro Street in Rocky Mount. It's an honor to be here with you all. Um, let me give you some um, a prelude to uh, the Edgecombe Works Initiative. So for me, like every individual business uh, organization over the past few years, the college was significantly impacted by the pandemic. And for us, it was in terms of stabilizing and maintaining enrollment. It was in supporting the general web welfare of our students and our faculty and staff. It was assisting students, staff, and faculty with new technology tools. It was also holding and hosting events, which we couldn't do during the pandemic and just doing businesses in general. So while some challenges still exist, we, like others who live and work here in Edgecombe County, have still persevered, overcome, and, and are rising to greater heights than ever before. So with that, two of the things that became so evident for me as president and as a resident here during this time were two things. One. We can no longer afford to continue doing business as usual. And two, that we can do so much more when we work together. And I know you all know that, but I just wanted to stress that with you all. So considering that, I'm so pleased to stand before you and to stand with you um, concerning the Edgecombe Works Initiative. And for me, even though Mr. Evans gave it the proper name, Edgecombe Works, I put the exclamation point at the end so when you revise the PowerPoint, put that on there. So to me, it's Edgecombe Works. We're excited about it. Um, so that initiative, including what he showed earlier with the career navigator position, 
this is to offer three specific pathways, you see that on the slide there, to support for our local residents who are interested in pursuing a great career, not just any career, a great career, both in county government, so as to help support the county, but also for our select local employers too. So um, to me, this investment uh, is not just an investment in education, this is an investment for our citizens, it's for our communities, for our future, it's for us reaching our potential and for our students to do so as well. Um, as you see with the first item, the earn as you learn, incoming and seasoned staff in select areas can work and go to school to gain work-related credentials. So the idea is to help some of your current employees as well as brand new employees to gain the skills that they need to be better prepared to be all they can be for what we need them to be here in Edgecombe County. So it's a, a partnership, if you will, between us and the county to help them continue to grow. So it's professional development uh, as well as allowing them to uh, grow and prosper and be all they can be. Because if we can help them succeed, it helps all of us succeed. The Promise program is similar to what you see with a lot of states and other, um, we'll say, universities. For example, ECU has a Pirate Promise program. So it's basically a last dollar initiative to help uh, students with um, their various costs because financial aid, even though it can be significant for uh, our students at the community college level, it still doesn't cover all of their costs. And unfortunately, we have a lot of students who try to live on their financial aid. And even though uh, some of them do that, it's still not enough in terms of taking care of their transportation needs, child care needs, uh, food, and housing uh, costs as well. So um, that Promise program helps to provide that last dollar amount to help our students. And then the Edgecombe Works Academy is more of a um, short-term continuing education workforce training program akin to um, uh, some of the programs that have been out there before. Um, this would be a 96-hour minimum uh, program that would provide intensive study for uh, residents and employees to learn about how to work in teams, how to work smart, uh, safety and security in the workplace, um, OSHA 10 regulations, and, um, and so much more. So it helps to provide that baseline that they need to go into any work environment here in the county to be successful. So that's what you see there. I'm happy to partner with you all on this, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. And so uh, to, to wrap this up, um, we hope that this budget adequately reflects the priorities that the board has shared with us and our team. It reflects the priorities of our citizens, and that being educational workforce, economic growth, public safety, and employee salaries. Uh, just as a, as a note, footnote, if you will, um, just to remind our board and let the citizens know that there is a state statute that says that any board member that serves on any board that we would potentially fund um, would have to excuse themselves from voting. We're not going to vote on the budget tonight, but when it comes time to vote on the budget, uh, some of our board members do serve on some of the boards and the organizations that we intend to fund. And so for those particular items, they will be excusing themselves from voting on those things. So just, just so. Um, that is uh, the proposed budget, Mr. Chairman. I know that took some time, but in an effort, as you saw in our vision statement as an organization, one of our, uh, one of our values there is transparency. So we want to be as transparent as we can on our budget. We certainly can't go through it line by line, but we want to give you a broad overview of the budget as it's proposed for FY24. Thank you, Ms. Evans. I think that was a good overview and, a, and, a, and an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. <coughs> At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call for public, public comments on the budget from the public. <coughs> so if there's anybody that can come forward, please state your name and address and whatever comments. Now, after this will be public petition. These comments are for the budget. Is there anybody who would like to speak at this time? Please come forward. John Walker, 1303 North Main Street in Tarboro. I'm one of Ms. Harris's constituents. I have covered public meetings since 1991. 
and this is the best hour that I think I've ever spent in a public meeting because of the way it was presented, the way the people in this room were able to see the numbers. Uh, this board's to be commended. Uh, and I need to apologize to my first editor, uh, the late Pitt Furman, because 57 years ago when I started, he said, you'll damn well report it. You won't be part of it. But I felt that the fact that I have, I have sat through so many of these in three different states, uh, this was a transparent process, a very open process. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to thank you for those comments. <laughs> Is there anybody else to speak? Uh, Bronson Williams, 1230 Cokey Road in Rocky Mount, uh, North Carolina. I, I actually share the same sentiments that Mr. Walker uh, just gave to the commission as regards to the budget. Uh, certainly, uh, having gone through the budget, had some uh, questions about it, was able to, to get those questions, one being the, the level of, of interest. And I realized that as interest really is going up, I just don't have that much money to see that kind of interest. Uh, but certainly, uh, that that's great. And the 20% the of the budget that provides for education, uh, we always wish we could pay more to education, but, but the reality is it is what it is. We live within our means and see the great things that Edge Country Community College is doing, et cetera, to, to see our county uh, grow. So super. Uh, excited about that and, and again many other things as you just said the way it was laid out the the uh, the video presentation that you made available through social media as well to ensure that people uh, were engaged in the process uh, and your willingness to respond to those things is certainly to be commended uh, for you Mr. Evans and and the board for that for their work uh, thank you so much thank you. is there anybody else to speak hearing none at this time, I will go to the public hearing. And at this time, we call the public to open the floor for the public to make a public petition. If anybody here to speak at a public petition, please come forward and state your name and address for the public record. Is there anybody here to speak? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, William Ellis uh, reside at 1959 Webbs Lake Road in Macclesfield. I'm here uh, as, as a fellow board member. Many times you don't hear many thank yous or compliments, although you just heard two, so <laughs> I'm third tonight. But um, I would like to thank the board and also Mr. Evans for their hard work and diligence with the sign at Handy Corner crossroads. It was um, directed about three weeks ago and I think it shows the board's willingness to help small communities uh, and now it's a, a fixture of pride within our small community of Handy Corner and I wanted to personally thank each and every one of you um, and Mr. Evans I think he got into a little more than what we initially started but he stayed with it with his diligence and hard work and just know that I appreciate it and the residents of Handy Corner, North Carolina, appreciate it. Thank you very much. I got a little picture of the sign for each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is an excellent uh, public video. I don't know if I can let you come to fight. This is the next night. You don't have your time. Are you going to complain? This is just a suggestion. This is just a suggestion. I will say, the uh, television show in the morning, and, and someone called in uh, this morning and, and made a, a thought or idea and that was to have a tax payment center, uh, maybe in, in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, for convenience of seniors and things that HM might have been tried before, I have no idea. Uh, but that was just something someone called in and she talked about her, her drive to Tarboro. 
uh, if there was an option. And, and I hope they kind of do what they do, they can receive some more money from Apple or Tax and Brown. So I think it's a plus positive opportunity. Uh, if it was satellite hours, I don't know what the feasibility of that is, but perhaps if they were select hours at one of your current buildings, it might be work and that person does some additional things to support that, that particular assignment. Appreciate we'll, it. We'll take that on advice. <laughs> Is everybody at the speed? Here's none. Moving on to other business. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we get to agenda item A, which is budget amendments, you do have at your place a supplemental agenda that I would uh, request you consider uh, allowing us to add this to the agenda tonight. This is related to uh, Board of Sewer District 6. As you know, we've got funding that has been reserved for the UFD Rural Development. It's a total of a little over $7 million project. $2.6 million of that is loan. The rest of that is grant. Um, we will appear before the Local Government Commission tomorrow. Um, any borrowing of counties and towns over a certain amount, over a certain period of time, has to be approved by the LGC. And so here are resolutions our, our bond council just recently was able to finalize and to prepare for us to be able to, uh, for your consideration tonight, um, so that we can uh, have this approved by the LBC tomorrow. So as you'll see, first of all, if it's okay to add it to, uh, to the agenda here, is that okay? All right, yes, sir. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we do have funds committed from USDA Rural Development to renovate and improve the sewer system in District 6, which is the town of Princeville. The project includes 2619000 in revenue bonds, which must be approved by the local government commission. At your May meeting, you approved a resolution to submit an application to appear before the LGC at their June meeting, as I mentioned, which will be tomorrow. Now we need your approval to issue these revenue bonds for the purpose of the project. You have at your place a copy of three resolutions. The first would be to uh, approve the issuance of the bonds of $2,619,000. The second resolution is regarding... Let me, let me get the first one. The first, one. What? The, the first resolution is, the, uh, is to issue the $2,619,000 uh, in bonds. Do I have a motion? Second. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, you need to recess as board commissioners and convene as board of sewer district six. Thank you. Motion to recess and convene as So moved. Second. Second. Questions? All in the table, let me know how to vote. Aye. 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 All opposed, we now sit as the governing body of us for board of sewer district six. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, the motion is what? So the motion is to first approve the resolution to issue the bonds in the amount of $2,619,000. Well, got a motion on us. And a second. And a second. Question. All in favor, let me know how to vote. Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, none of the resolution is approved. Next resolution. The second resolution is a resolution uh, of an intent to reimburse. That meaning that if there are any uh, costs related to this project prior to those bonds being issued that they will be reimbursed to the district uh, per this resolution. Recommended. Do I have a motion? Yes. Sir. Questions? All in favor, let me know how to vote. Aye. 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 All opposed? Yeah, not it is approved. And the third and final resolution is the um, bond order authorization. So this will authorize the issuance of these bonds uh, per the terms as listed in this resolution. I will note that we have to go out with a request for proposals to entities that might be interested in investing or purchasing these bonds. Uh, PNC uh, Bank is the only entity that responded. And so with your approval, subject to the local government's uh, commission's approval tomorrow, these bonds will be issued uh, to PNC Bank. I do want to note that um, this will be temporary financing, that permanent financing will be converted to uh, USDA loan. Motion to approve that resolution. Second. Second. Questions? All in favor, let it be known. I vote sign aye. Aye. All opposed? Hear none. It is approved. Is it all for the Governor Martin? Yes, sir. Motion for John is as uh, the water of 
was with his receipts. We're not standing as only they let me know I was at high. Aye. All the polls, clearly not. We're not standing as county commissioners, Governor Mike Butler. Board of Commissioners, yes, sir. So we're back on agenda item. Agenda item eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, agenda item A is consideration of approval of budget amendments. You'll see that budget amendments are separated based on those that require your approval at the front of that stack. The remainder are either approved by me or uh, are reviewed and approved by our uh, chief financial officer. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And that would be one through? So it would be requesting your approval of budget amendments one through five. One through five? Yes, sir. Uh, any questions for Mr. Evans on the budget amendments one through five? If not, is there a motion to approve the budget amendments one through five? Second. Second. Questions? All in favor of that be known by sign aye. Aye. All opposed? And the time those budget amendments are approved. Item B is regarding a change to our family planning coordinator position. Uh, to better suit the needs of the health department, Ms. Michelle Etheridge, our health director, recommended a revision of the pub public health nurse two position, which serves as our family planning coordinator. The recommendation is to change the position to a PHN three, um, and the description will be a family planning and maternity coordinator. It will be moving it from grade 19 to grade 20. You'll see a copy of proposed changes to the job description recommended. You. Motion. Second. Second. Questions? All in favor, let me know that one side aye. Aye. All opposed? Hearing none. It is approved. Okay. Item C is regarding proposed uh, funding for home and community care block grant from FY24. I'd like to invite Ms. Natalie Vance, our deputy county manager, to come forward uh, to give you an overview of that record. North Carolina General Statutes has established a home and community care block grant for older adults to be administered by the North Carolina Division of Aging. The home and community care block grant is composed of funding for in-home and community-based services for older adults. The county is charged with developing and implementing a funding plan locally that meets the needs of older adults in our county with funds provided through the home and community care block grant. This proposed funding plan that you all have in your packet is submitted based off the recommendations from the Edgecombe County HCCBG Committee who met in April to review the submitted funding proposals. This year we received over $1 million in funding requests and our projected funding allotment available for obligation is $599,680. It is um, our recommendation that the county commissioners approve and adopt the recommended funding plan. I do have Ms. Mary Marlin here with the Upper Coastal Plain Council of Government Area Agency on Aging. She's the Aging Program Director and she's available to answer any questions you have about Do you have any comments? Well. Thank you. Um, just the only comment that I have is that the committee um, every year works hard to make sure that the selection that is um, presented to the commissioners is the, in the best interest of the um, citizens in Edgecombe County. Um, and this year, the funding allocation or the, the recommendation um, for 23-24 will allow for the same service mix, but with more direction from the participants and their families. Since this plan does allow for continued funding of consumer-directed services, um, and any of the following consumer directed care services can be included in the county funding plan um, to include the care advisor, personal care sup supplies, nutritional supplement, emergency response equipment, medical adaptive equipment, personal assistant, adult day services, financial management services, and home delivered meals. And so while some of the providers um, may not be the same, the mix it still incorporates the seven services that have been funded in um, Edgecombe County. So that mix includes in-home aid, consumer directed, transportation, home delivered meals, senior center operations, and um, again, under the consumer directed, it can include adult daycare. Any questions? 
$250,000 to uh, be administered through the Department of Social Services in this program that, that uh, we titled the Community Impact Program. So we have uh, wrapped that program up and you'll see the numbers that we've been able to serve overall, 550 families have been assisted with those funds. So we're grateful for that. Grateful for Ms. Betty Battle, our director, who uh, really facilitated that idea, and she and her staff, who took on the additional duties, being short staff of processing all these additional applications, but to the benefit of our citizens. So I just want to point that out. Make sure they voice this thing. Yes, sir. Manager report. Go ahead, Mr. Um, you'll see there are a number of items under the manager's report. I'll come back to item C real quick. I do want to mention that um, item D, I noted there, call for a special meeting. Actually, at the end of this meeting, we'll ask that you reset this meeting for it to be reconvened on the 26th so that um, you can take final consideration of the budget. Uh, you do have a meeting already called for June 21st at 10 a.m., and that is to discuss the compensation plan I have added to that if you are okay with also you hearing a presentation about broadband deployment you know we have uh, a new company to the table that's been awarded great grant funds they will be there to present or give you a brief overview of their plans for for those funds um, um, we talked about um, uh, the uh, handy corner there's a picture of that in there as well uh, also a reminder that you approved uh, a holiday for us uh, for Juneteenth, and that will be on June 19th. Uh, that is a Monday, so our um, county operations will be closed on June 19th in observance of Juneteenth. Uh, so going back to item C, um, uh, update on county line merge, I'd like to invite Mr. Ronnie Sharp, who's with the Edgecombe County School System, working with the uh, transition. You all had the opportunity to, uh, to meet him um, before we have some information there, we certainly won't, um, won't hold you much longer, but I'm grateful for Mr. Sharp being here tonight just to tell you a little bit about, um, tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work that he's been doing since he's been on board. No worries, you'll be less collective. So, all right. Good evening, everyone. It is with great honor and humility that I come before you tonight to share with you just some of the highlights regarding where we are with the merger process. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Ron Sharp. I'm a former resident of Edgecombe County in the town of Tarboro, North Carolina where my mother and my sisters and other relatives currently live in this area. Uh, I'm very proud to be a member of this community. Um, I uh, served here for 13 years in the educational system as a visual arts teacher at Phillips Motor Grove, Kirkwood and Robinson, North Edgecombe, and the Phillips Alternative School, which is now the Bridges Building. I am, I am uh, very humble by the opportunity to serve the citizenry uh, and our constituents here in Edgecombe County as well as our leadership. Obviously, if this is joint effort, something that has perhaps uh, um, not been done um, as I continue to research this process, it seems that we are building this plan, as they say, that is, as it continues to fly. So I just want to highlight some of the areas where we are are working and concentrating and focusing right now. And um, so I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to serve here. The first slide uh, just, just basically highlights uh, the, um, the presentation. And I just wanted to honor a couple of people, uh, just take this opportunity to honor some of the people who are, are instrumental uh, in um, developing the designs that you see who are working hard to create the uh, the school models, or taking a look at and assessing all of the building and the structures, or taking a look at creating and hopefully an innovative high school for uh, the East Rocky Mountain uh, area. And those persons are um, Arlene Gordon Gray, uh, Aaron Swanson, Jessica Parker, uh, England Austin, uh, myself, of course, led by our STEAM superintendent, our board chair, and you all the county commissioners. So thank you for that. 
if you look closely, that was a copy of our agenda that was held at our recent uh, uh, meeting that was uh, held right there at Edgecombe Community College, the Rocky Mountain campus, and you can read that for yourself. So we're going to move quickly. I know there's so much more to go. These were our meeting outcomes. If you look closely at those, we were one of the goals was to connect with some of our new returning team members because we had not met since June 7 of 2022. Uh, we also wanted to hear updates in, for those persons who were not uh, a part of that transition team during June of 2007. We wanted to try to update them, provide some historical context with regards to whether the merger originated and where we are now. We also wanted to recap a little bit of the designs team's experiences and to gain clarity on what questions we have as designers moving towards the future around our homecoming of 2024, where our students will begin in the year, the fall of 2024-25. Just a little, little get to meet and greet session. And uh, these were our group agreements. I think all of you have copies of, of these? Yes, okay. So you can look more carefully at those. These were our group agreements that we covered very briefly. This is a sort of uh, uh, an area where we uh, highlighted some of our main components where we were in March of 2022 through May of 2022, and then we moved forward very quickly to where we are now in May of 2023. Where are we now? Uh, at this point, uh, I took an opportunity for about 10, 12 minutes to highlight to the group a little bit of the historical context where the merger began, where the process began, what some of the conflicts were um, between Nash and Hitchcomb and, and why it's now necessary to take those kids underneath our arms, to embrace them, to bring them back into the Hitchcomb County School where we will consider them our homecoming students moving forward. Uh, next, you, um, there was a little bit about the tale of those two cities and that included some additional information on the historical context. And this slide right here basically is a link for all of you who wish to uh, acquire some additional information regarding um, the demerger and its processes, its history. These are our May June priorities. Um, I'm just going to highlight just a couple of them real quickly. Where it says site visit schedule, those site visits were actually completed um, and uh, we were allowed access. Uh, entry into those four school sites uh, that belonged well, that will soon belong to us um, and um, that that group consisted of uh, the superintendent for Nash County Public Schools Dr. Stephen Ellis, uh, Ms. Angie Miller, uh, Ms. Jessica Parker, Mr. Carlton Perkins, um, myself and two of the maintenance leadership personnel from National. If you look at school designs, you can see that we completed an inspiration visit at the uh, Big Picture Learning School in Nashville, where we brought back lots of great ideas, hopefully that we can incorporate into our school system and ultimately into our future high school. And uh, last but not least, uh, you can see where communications will be exploring prioritizing our district website. We've got an okay uh, from Mr. Hayes. He's going to help us to build that. And also we'll rebuild our social media presence in Nash and also in Edgecombe County. And uh, we're going to launch our community survey again to acquire feedback from the residents of East Rocky Mountain so that we can design with them and not for them. And for this next slide, you will see these are the four schools that will be incorporated into our school system. And additionally, the next slide, you will note uh, that our goal of equity in East Rocky Mountain is to continue to develop a methodology with regards to how we as a design team can design school models and student programs with and not for our community. Note also that we are in the process of meeting as a high level school design team but we're exploring what we're currently exploring with models we met last week and we had a debriefing session following our meeting at Edgecombe Community College uh, where we're looking logistically at those school numbers, those school capacities, also our Edgecombe County school numbers, 
our Edgecombe County, our current Edgecombe County school numbers, our current Edgecombe County school number capacities to see if we can acquire some additional consolidation in terms of efficiency moving forward. And um, the next slide was an area where we uh, allowed our partners who were present at the meeting uh, to, to um, provide some input with regards to what questions they might have. Uh, and um, we, uh, you can see right here where we ask those questions, how can I be most helpful? What school will my kids be attending? And uh, how will we meet with those families who are going to be affected by the merger? We uh, acquired and composed a list of almost 100 responses, three on each one of the note cards, and we compiled that list, and that list we are going to respond to, and that's going to comprise most of the information uh, so that we can prepare for those questions that will you know, undoubtedly be posed at those community meetings which we are currently designing. Wanted to make sure that we, you know, rooted those in empathy, and that we again sought um, the input from our community members to design the school system uh, for them. Uh, the next slide, very quickly, again is those next needed things uh, as a designer. What do you want to know more about? How to hear the updates? Uh, and this is this is something that will move to the following slide where. You will see my email address where you can email me uh, with these questions if you have those outstanding questions and you would like to you know try to just try to help us out in terms of what your input is what your thinking is and i'll move very quickly forward as i will not try to keep you all here all night as you have been inundated with lots of information so far the next slide is uh where we share it out to the group and the following slide is what we plan to do next as a design team. This is the one that I'd like for you all to uh, examine most carefully in your leisure time, if you will. And lastly, uh, we uh, created uh, an exit ticket um, and we asked what is one amazing idea uh, that you might have or that you could uh, help us with to get the word out in the community about our homecoming students who will be um, with us during the 2024-25 school year. And last but not least, uh, our next meeting, which has not been confirmed. However, uh, we you can see there, well, actually, it's not there. I don't know what happened with that one. Well, let me just read it real quickly. It says, uh, the week of June 12th, our district leader, leaders at the, uh, will be meeting at the Standards Lab. The week of June 26th, district leaders are going to be meeting at Abbott. The week of the 4th is mostly folk are on vacation. The week of the 10th is our best option. So if you all will share with us which one of those um, days during that week would be a day that would uh, be least obtrusive to you in terms of your schedule, you can share that. We'll take a look at those and we'll try to create a schedule that will encompass and uh, ingratiate uh, us to um, whatever your goals are for that week. And uh, any questions? Question the sub. I'm getting right down to the nuts and bolts. Yes, I, I need to know what constituents he's asking me about. Um, <coughs> when will we really find out? What I want to know is people are asking how many students are going to be involved, how many teachers are involved, and you keep saying home to coming. And I have a problem with that because those kids were Rocky Mount City Schools. They've never been in Edgecombe County Public Schools. Yes, sir. So that's why I said, you know, how can we say come back home when they've never actually been a part of that system? Okay. Um, so I wanted to know those kind of questions. And I've been reading a lot about the Senate Bill 382. I wanted to know from you or the attorney. What those amendments that have been put into place, uh, how does that change Senate Bill 382? That question, obviously. Well, one of you read that. Well, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, Senate Bill 382 is the 2016 right. bill. And the new, I believe you're referring to the new Senate Bill 248, which is the <coughs> um, pending bill. 
and as you know, that mostly originally dealt with redrawing the school board district from Nash County from 11 to 7 members and aligning those districts with the Nash County commissioners. Uh, it has since been amended to actually provide for a county line merger or demerger beginning July 1, 2024. Uh, but as that bill reads now, regardless of you know, the action of this board, that county line merger would be triggered for July 1, 2024. The amendment also added the date for when the plan would be, the plan submitted by the two counties and two school boards would be submitted for approval by the state. And the 2016 bill, that was to be done within 120 days from the certification of the local government commission that certain funds have not been paid. So this takes out some of the uncertainty and has a day certain for uh, some of those things. The, the, for the most part, the bill redefines how the Nash Board of Education members are elected where those districts are, and it provides that the, the merger will happen on July 1, 2024, if this is passed. Okay. My other question, um, I was looking at some legislation where it said um, November, I believe of 2023, should Edge come and Nash have not come to a consensus that the State Board of Education would come up with a plan. And I'm trying to find out. I mean, we're talking about six months. Are we on the path to that, or are we going to miss the deadline and the State Board of Education actually have to come and do that plan? Because I'm looking at it, it's like we're living like a turtle right here. And six months a lot of things have to be put in place or they'll be put in place for us so is that part of your demerger team design meeting so i just want to make sure i understand the question are you, are you asking us as a demerger design team right have you have you been reading that possible legislation that they're going to put in place about um, november no, ma'am, we haven't read the possible legislation with regards to when it's going to occur uh, there because our our sense was that the kind of line diversion would be triggered by the non-payment of you know a particular part of the funding from July 1st, right? And and as he just stated, if that does not occur on July 1st, then officially the merger will occur. So we're going to plan moving forward as if it's going to happen. We're putting in all of the things that we need to put in place to make sure our kids are serviced and that they are provided the opportunity to be successful as, as successful as possible. And with regards to your previous question about homecomings, another great question, both great questions. Um, the reason why we chose that terminology, homecoming, uh, because there's there's a sense when we talk to the community and they hear the word demerger, it sort of carries such a negative connotation. And we wanted to create um, a positiveness about, about you know, this mer merger as you as well. I was going to say, are we going to change the word? Because our manager has told us that word was really not the word. Right. Use. Demerger, he says, isn't the appropriate terminology. Merger is the appropriate terminology. But we want to you know, go a step further in terms of our communication with the general public and, and how we highlight what we're doing by creating you know, a little bit of a positiveness about that word and those folk coming home. In terms of your question about them coming home, um, my sense is they're in Edgecombe County. They're literally coming home to us now. They've been a part, obviously, of the National Rock and Rock School System. And I recognize that you know, throughout their historical context, the historical context you know, of, 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 of all of the years that they've been a part of the system and there, there, you know, there is, therein lies a lot of historical value with that. Um, however, um, they're going to be ours pretty soon. Mr. Peters, and the structure that we operate on, what was the number? So, to be clear, that, that plan that we really referenced was also referenced in 382. It just wasn't a date certain because it was unclear if that would ever happen. And now that we know it's believe it will happen beginning the, the funds will be paid as part of the 2024 budget then <clears throat> that November day is about what it would have been anyway that um, the previous 
vote will be on call for 120 days after LGC certifies the project today. Okay. This is about where we are. But I think just to be give you some of my understanding, according to what we were originally operating on, uh, the triggering mechanism is passes of the budget. And that's what we were operating on. The triggering mechanism for any of this is the budget, which at that time, Mr. Evans was going to send a letter, okay, um, to that. So to, to the statute that we were operating on, that has not been triggered. Okay, that will be triggered on June, please, the budget. When we vote to approve the budget, when we will be voting not to send those funds, okay? That's the, that was the triggering mechanism. That is, was the instructions uh, given to our school system in terms of, but in terms of, I, I still see, this, even the new statute, the planning, has to be done by, and in terms of what we hope that might the outcome might be, will be done by most of the school boards. In terms of our school and and, and nice kind of school boards deciding what kind of plan that would best they can best operate on because some of the intent it was that some of the the, the children that are present in the nice kind of school system. We still have the opportunity to stay. Those high school without us have the opportunity to stay in that system. And that's something that the school boards would more than likely have to agree to. Okay. Okay. So the main part of the planning of this is still in the new statute, as I understand it, does say that we, we the two county kind of boards, would have to agree to that plan. So I still see, I don't see much changing as a result other than. Uh, where if this board didn't approve it in the budget, it don't make no difference now, <laughs> okay? Yeah. The final bill, and I understand the bill, I understand I can't say that it has, has or has not, because in turn, in turn, you check it in that way. So nothing has changed, but it will happen if that bill passed. And Mr. Chairman, if I could also add, I think it's important to know that outside of this design team, which is a, a committee I, I serve on it, um, that's really looking at you know ideas for educating the students as well as ideas of how to engage the community that will be affected. Outside of that, there have been meetings that have involved uh, both of the county chairmen, Ashton Edgecombe County Chairman both of the county managers, the two county attorneys, the two superintendents, the two board of education chairpersons, the two board of education attorneys, as well as Mr. Sharp and a few other staff people. Yes, sir. Um, we have met twice already um, and work in the schedule a third meeting. The gist of that group has been to make sure that we all understand the timeline. Then, as it was laid out by Senate Bill 382, now, potentially, Senate Bill 248. So I think to, to Ms. Harris' question, some of the things that we would like to know, we don't know. Okay. We don't know until until the, the, the school boards, in terms of the final plan. Uh, we do know that if they'll pass, we go school for hours. Okay. And we do know that they. I do know that I believe that they've got a competent um, staff at the school system to make sure that we can plan and that we encompass um, that area. And what you just said, Rob, I don't know what you just said those schools are ours. They will be ours. They will be they ours. Will. Does that mean lock, stop, and barrel? Well, the school, just the school names, school children, or the school building, and what's inside? That the, the real estate, the, the real estate, once that passes and uh, the, the, the legislature passes, the real estate, our attorneys and their attorneys will make, the real estate will transfer to our school system. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The, the bill mentions, in the 2016 bill, it also mentions real property, furnishing improvements, um, equipment, buses, bands, sports equipment, textbooks, all that. Is buses, 
everything that comes with it, all of that will be transferred. Statute. Legislation speaks to that. Another question. Thank you, Mr. Sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Sir. You're welcome. The other thing I saw in the manager's report. Uh, Mr. Sir, nothing else. I have to answer any questions that you might have on the. Uh, any questions from the board? Just one comment. Go ahead. We're fifth on unemployment, which we've been hovering at one and two for as long as I've ever come to a meeting. <laughs> so I wanted to make that publicly. We take a little win. I've not seen it above two. As Ms. Harris just mentioned, we have been at six uh, once or twice. And another comment is occupancy tax for our hotel seems to be doing great. So that's yes. so that's been that's really nice to see. That that shows you what we're doing and people that we're making. So just kind of on track. We're twelve thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars over that as of. Commission's report. Here, nine. Must be there, Mike. Great. Yeah, the rest of it. Moving it. Okay. Not going to rush this one. Go ahead. I find myself here pretty confused about what's going on. We, uh, I don't know what we're talking about. It's the same thing we've been talking about for two years now. And on June 26th, we are going to transfer students to this county. And we have no nuts and bolts about what is going to happen. I've sent a question into the Edgecombe County Board Superintendent. I got no answers. We're going into this. I understand the information is supposed to be available on November the 1st. And I appreciate what Mr. Sharp brought here tonight and how he presented it. We need answers on the nuts and bolts of what's going to happen. And when is that going to happen? We need to know where students are going, how many will be transferred, how many will stay, how many will re remain in the Nash County system. And we're sitting here, we don't know anything. And I don't think we'll have those answers. We've got to have answers. I think we will. We don't even have a superintendent. Uh, well, I think that's a, a school board that's in They're going to have to name some interim. I think. I think it's, it's, it's a, I think it's going to be it's a school board. The legislature is a school board issue. They are going to bring us some answers. I Me? think, I, I think they will meet the, I think they will meet the timeline. I think they are over there doing their job, and they, uh, until we pass this budget, I think they're doing things that we don't know, and we can't micromanage them in terms of how they do their job. I'm not trying to micromanage. We, we, I think that's what we are. What we are. It's a school board job to do. It's our job to find. I think they will be doing their job. Uh, I don't think we can sit here and say that they are not because the time frames are not here yet. What is the time frame? It, uh, when the time frames are outlined in the statute, outlined in terms of when we send that letter to the local government commission, when we then we can be dealing with time. Now. It has not been triggered. That's. Just my position. We can. Mark, we absolutely do. We just. I will close with this thing. This has been going on for three years. We know it's coming June the 26th. We've asked, I've asked, and asked, and asked. And we just don't have any answers about the things that people want to know. Not just me. People want to know. And the uproar is going to come whenever we furnish the answers, if we ever get the answers, and I just don't understand it, and I will leave it at that. And you can say what you want about micromanaging. We are the funding source for the schools. It falls on us in the end. ADM is not going to save us from what we need. Everybody seems to think that it is. It's not. That's just all I got to say. I can only say this. Uh, let us see the past the hours. Exactly. And the hours at that time to fund. Uh, based on our ability to fund. Good evening, not come with funding. The children, they're not just they're drop the children. Yeah, yeah. We have, we've not been told what that funding is. Exactly. That is the part that everyone here needs to acknowledge, is that we are the funding body and we are the gap there. And we have asked explicitly what that funding gap is and we have not. I don't think we know yet. 
Well, that's why I asked the list of questions I asked the minutes Because it's either saying, we'll pass, if we pass the budget on June 26th, with what we have now, and then the school board brings something back, then somebody's got to find that money for what they bring back. I, we, we will we do what we have been done with all the agencies. We're appropriate according to our business to your phone. And that's so what are you going to do? We, have, we never have funded nobody out there at their full request. We don't fund that shirt. We don't find that as a very service. What we do, we look at our budget and appropriate what, what we can. But if we don't fund those children. Remember, we're not Ash County. We're not in the clear where we can't be sued because we don't supply what they need for schools. That's next camp. They're not Ash County. We're not sitting <laughs> in that corner. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna fund what our budget can afford us to fund. We can't fund that, and we don't have revenue to the fund. It's always a question. We don't know fully how we're going to fund what Mr. Evans has proposed until we pass this budget. But if we don't fund the money for students, we will be sued. We, we're going to fund you. We're going to fund our children. You say that according to what we can afford. That's what we always do. <laughs> <laughs> It's not questionable whether we can afford or not. We've got to do it. And we've got to do what we can do. We're going to do it. I think, I, I, and we, we will, we will know. But and that's, that's based on we, we are not funding them for this year because of the fact we are, we are not doing the we, we are doing additional um, what's it, uh, supplement 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 uh, for our teachers. Okay. But uh, in terms of the gap line, we're not funding, but, it, but we will be funding at the same uh, uh, number as we're funding our age on the country. We won't have, there was no gap money to fund if we bring them back. There is no gap money to fund because we will be funding that same uh, uh, rate that we funded our uh, own. But in that same conversation, we're talking about sending students that go to school in Nash County and now, and we're still going to have to fund them. And that's, and, that, and, that's, and that's where our school boards, that's where the school boards, that's where the school boards. I understand that's what school, school boards do, but it's funding. It's we just, control funding. It's right. It's right. But that's a fundamental funding question. I think, well, we never going to answer this question because we don't disagree. <laughs> is it, it uh, I mean, is it, uh, we're going to argue all night about this one. Um, is there any other questions or comments on it? Well, I, I don't know how you build a school system without knowing how much money you have to build a school system. And that's coming. We don't have it there. And for a parent that might have a child in middle school who may come, or elementary school who may be coming to educate um, schools, I'm talking about the high school. Suppose they got a high school and they got a middle school. How is it fair for the middle school to have to get on the bus and go somewhere else? The high school don't have to change. Well, with all due respect, it's too late to ask that question. It'll happen on the 26th. We'll figure it out after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing that we've got to maybe we to consider the legislative passage in that day. But how many mandates have we gotten from the legislature without money to go with them? So just because they mandate it don't mean they're going to send you any more of their bridges. There is no money in this bill to come, that's coming for that. So I, I guess my, my bottom line is that I think we have been, uh, as we look at funding the corporations, as we look at our revenue streams, we make the decisions based on what we are able to as, as each year we the superintendent request additional funding and the, the manager and the superintendent they come to some figures as it relates to the community college some agreement in terms of what we want to fund and that's the budgeting process 
So we would continue the same budget process that we have used. And, and that means that, uh, that something like it has to be cut here or there, but uh, we have not had any plans in the past uh, in terms of how we do that process. And I, I don't project any, any problems into it. I don't. Change the subject. That's okay. Please help me change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I take it in. Yep, I can get it. Okay. <laughs> I, I've, I've made this request several times, and I think that I would I would like to, and if other commissioners would like to, I would like to see updated leasing numbers. I've requested this, and I'd like to see it before we vote on the budget. Updated okay, what? Updated leasing versus owning cars for the sheriff's office. And the last time we saw that was five years ago, 2018. Cars are different now. It's not, it's not the same economic environment. I, I know that that's a hot button issue for the sheriff and his entire staff right now on that. Um, I've got a list of stuff. I'm meeting with him tomorrow to discuss it even more. Um, but I think that we need, before we make a capital decision this year, we need to look at that. Thank you. Uh, I think that could be some agreement on Please bring us. Uh, I, I don't see your objections to Please bring us that. And, and uh, we had talked about it today, I think I'm actually already decided, okay, that he's going to break that information, okay. Yeah, but I, I think before the 26th. But, but get that information to the board. Yeah. Get it out to the board. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Any other requests? <clears throat> if none, moving on, alternative report. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we are scheduled to go into, we don't need to get about it. We're scheduled to go into closed session to discuss the back of our development. No matter, it's the most important closed session. Mm -hmm. Questions? All in favor, let it be known by the vote. Sign aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.